Welcome to the J-Boy Show, hosted by Jake Crane, the fastest growing sports show in the nation. I'm Coach Hugh Freeze. This is Super Bowl champion Brandon Graham. Hey, this is DJ Shockley, and you're watching. And you're watching. And thanks for watching the J-Boy Show. Hello, everybody, and thanks for hopping in again. Another edition of the J-Boy Show. Again, the guests just keep flowing. Got another guy coming on today I have a hell of a lot of respect for. Played at the highest level, doing his thing now in sports media, uh, taking over in 11 states. I'm going to get to that. But first, let me give a shout out to our partners over at betonline.ag. Online casino is always open. I know I say it all the time, but these guys are 24-7. They've got their March Madness stuff going on. They're going to put the Sharps out early. They're not playing any games. They're going to give you a chance to win. We've got Major League Baseball opening day coming up as well. And look, we've got FCS playing college football right now. So uh, if you you are missing your college football bets, there's a way to to dance a little bit in there, and they're going to help you out. So head over to betonline.ag today and tell them J-Boy sent you. You know the drill. But without further ado, uh, again, I kind of talked a little bit, you know, before we got into the, uh, the bet online stuff. This is a guy that if you watched him play, and a lot of y'all did, he played at LSU, played in the league, uh, physical, could do a lot of stuff, understands the game at a very high level, was a great team player. You can catch him with him and T-Bob A. Bear, another one of my favorites, uh, off the bench on 104.5 ESPN. They do an unbelievable job. Catch him in the afternoon on the SEC channel for Sirius XM, doing a lot of big things. And that's Jacob Hester. Hesty, what is up, man? What's up, brother? Hey, I mean, I'm excited for you. Forget all the things <laughs> I'm doing. My man, you've got the studio now. I mean, you're doing it big, and it is much deserved, man. You put in a lot of hard work. Well, I, you know, coming from you, I appreciate that, man. You know, we're just trying to do what we can, upgrade. Just like you guys is trying to give the audience the best experience to get them the most informed and bringing them as close to the game as possible. And, and again, you know, I'm really proud of you as well. And, again, it's I knew you were going to have success, man. I, shoot, I watched you run the ball at LSU, man. Uh, all you guys do over there uh, is get yards, first downs, and win. But uh, before we get to the football, I know you're a sports connoisseur like yeah. myself, and you've been watching this crazy – NCAA uh, March Madness that we've had. I think more uh, higher seeds have won than ever before. Uh, before we get into specifics, just what have you thought about the tournament? I love it. I love watching yeah. this stuff. No, absolutely. I actually have my uh, my boot up, Duncan Tiger. Even though oh, we lost yeah. to Michigan, I still got to represent uh, the LSU Tigers. But, man, I love March Madness. I mean, who doesn't? Mm -hmm. And we've really gotten to do a deep dive into this March Madness because we've been waiting on it for two years. Not having it last year was such man. a bummer because so many people love this event. I mean, you've got underdogs, Oral Roberts. You've got mm -hmm. Loyola Chicago. Who doesn't love that? And, and I'll be honest with you, right under LSU for me since 1999, I've been a Gonzaga Bulldog fan, man. I remember Matt Santangelo back in yeah. 1999. <laughs> <laughs> the West Coast Conference Tournament. I'm like, okay, who's this team right here? They've got uniforms. It looks like the, the numbers are falling off. Oh, They're no. ironed on, but they are out there balling. And they went to an Elite Eight that year. And ever since that year, I've followed their program. I think it's amazing that a small Catholic school in Spokane, Washington, it's got like 8,000 students, yeah. can be like this dog on the court, right? And they're like the blue blood. Mm -hmm. over the last couple of years they're the number one overall seed so you know teams like that stories like that we all love it man I, i'm looking forward to the sweet 16 it's got some sec flavor it's got some surprising pac 12 flavor yeah. the big 10 which was hyped up actually you know they got knocked out early only have one one team there so mm -hmm. this tournament has been exactly what we wanted we've had the underdogs we've had some blue bloods that have taken care of business we've had some conferences kind of step up at this time so i love it i know you love it and everyone should love it yeah oh it's it's great i mean you encapsulated that perfectly you you talk about the pac 12 uh, you talk about a flavor they got a whole menu they've thrown on there uh really <laughs> lost you know one time uh it, but you look at to me what i love to watch is i think it's been a real even playing field because there's not a ton of traveling but the parody in college basketball and you talk about gonzaga what mark few has done there and he didn't leave to go get a bigger job he did it his way He's built that program up. You look at Loyola Chicago uh, going to the Final Four a couple of years ago, then coming right back, and I think yep. they've got a chance. They were the better team. They were better than Illinois the other day when I watched them. And it's just amazing, and we all know how crazy of a sport basketball can be. Oral Roberts, I say, you know, uh, they're just talking their way out of everything these days. But uh, I can't wait to watch this Sweet 16 deal uh, go into the Elite Eight. We've got Bama and Arkansas in there. But you talk about LSU. Halfway through the SEC season, people left LSU yeah. for dead. 
And you look, they made a good run, gave Michigan a good run. Didn't have a big man inside, not a big right. answer for, for the Dickinson guy for Michigan. Uh, but Will Wade, uh, you know, I thought he did a really good job of, of keeping the players focused. And when you have some of the stuff that's gone on, uh, regardless of what side of the yeah. fence you fall on, he did a really good job of preparing them. And just looking at the SEC, Jacob, and I'm going to keep saying this, and I, I say it literally every time we talk about basketball, but I believe it's the truth, whether we have Paul B. and Cardi on, uh, somebody that's not a basketball analyst, whatever. When the SEC makes their mind up, that they want to be good at something. It is yep. not if, it is when. And I think the golden era of SEC basketball is upon us. I think this year it was a good league. Right. I don't think it was really elite, but I'm looking three years down the road and looking at these coaches from Musselman to Pearl to Oates, all the way down to Jerry Stackhouse at Vanderbilt. The SEC could be at the top of the mountain here sooner than later because, again, it's the SEC, and we all know, Hesty, it just means more, baby. No, you're exactly right, and it's a great point you make because 2014, 2015, I would say that's when the change happened, yes. right? When teams are like, okay, we've got it in football. We've certainly got it in baseball. We've got it in softball. We've got it in gymnastics. We have to be better in men's hoops. Even the women's hoop side of things, like they had to figure it out. LSU yeah. goes to five straight Final Fours. Tennessee does what they do. I mean, there's so many times we could point to Mississippi State, South Carolina, right? Okay, but men's hoops, man, you were behind. And they made that decision. You know how we're going to fix this? We're going to do exactly what you just said. We're going to bring in great coaches. Exactly that's right. going to be the difference. Like, that's why you have a Rick Barnes now. It's why you have a Will Wade, a Jerry Stackhouse, a Nato. It's, I mean, all the name. Kermit Davis at Ole Miss yeah. is one of the most undervalued coaches in all of college athletics, Agreed. not just basketball. And that's how they made the change. They said, we are going to buy into men's hoops. We are going to better these programs by bringing in great leaders to be able to lead these young men to be better, right? To be better on the court, to be better off the court, all those type of things. And then look, they put some money into it. Let's call it like they it did. Is, right? They did. You're starting to see training facilities for basketball only, weight rooms for basketball only, arenas. Ole Miss has a beautiful new arena, the pavilion there. It is fantastic. That's what you saw in about 2014 from the SEC and it's paid dividends ever since. Yeah, and it all goes back to recruiting. And, I mean, we have we had six SEC teams in the tournament, and Kentucky was not one of them. And I, I think it kind of shows you yeah. that the parity in the SEC, it's no longer Kentucky and Florida, and somebody will get hot for a year. Right. There, there's no really – you go on the road now in the SEC, especially even without fans this year, there's not really a cakewalk on the schedule. And Buzz Williams at Texas A&M, I'm telling you, is going to turn that yeah. thing around before it's said and done. He needed a ton of time. That roster needed a total remake. But, uh, you know, Jake, but before we get to football, everybody's talking Baylor and Gonzaga. I think those are the two teams that are going to play. At the end of the day, I got Baylor. I just – I love the way they're built. I love how physical they are. I know you got some okay. that Gonzaga love uh, you yeah, talked oh, yeah. about. But oh, yeah. just how pumped are you to see this matchup? Because I think it's coming down the pipe, man. It, it seems like we've been headed towards this path all basketball season. Like it was inevitable. Like this is going to happen. And we were mm -hmm. going to get them in the non-conference, obviously, and that game yeah. got canceled. People and forget every, about that. Yeah, everyone wanted that game. But I think it even makes it even that much sweeter that that game wasn't played. Yeah. Because now we're going to see it probably when it's all on the money for the championship, at least – we'd be surprised if that doesn't happen, right? Illinois had some some early buzz. Like, maybe they could be the team that beats Baylor or Gonzaga. They didn't even, you know, make it past yeah. Loyola Chicago. So they got <laughs> dominated in that game. So it they feels did. like we are headed to the two best teams playing each other. I know that's still a long way away. You got to get multiple wins to get there. But I think that everyone wants that matchup. Unless it's mm -hmm. your team, right? Unless your team's still yeah. in it, everyone wants to see Gonzaga, Baylor, the best versus the best, which one's going to play out? Because we don't get that many years. Like, we don't That's get like, these two teams that are really head and shoulders above everyone else. And then you've got a little bit of a gap between three, four, and five after that one and two. So, for me, uh, you know, obviously, like I mentioned, been a Zaga fan since 99, but I would <laughs> love that matchup because I think it is truly the two best teams. Yeah, I would. You talk about must see TV, Davian Mitchell guarding uh, uh, guarding Jalen Suggs. Yeah. That is a true NBA matchup. Uh, two guys that really specialize in what they do. Uh, but I do want to pivot. Uh, we're in spring practice. Uh, you right. look around the league. This is when the team is formed. And I want you to talk about this because, I mean, you did it. The, everybody thinks, you know, I wouldn't say everybody, but, but the casual fan, I think, believes that, you know, fall camp, all right, here we go. We're building the team and the chemistry. Right. It is built. Now, you got the new guys that typically come in during the summer. We see a lot more early enrollees now. But can you just talk about how the team is built in the spring and in those – 
optional summer workouts. Let me yeah. go ahead and tell you, it's not <laughs> optional. Yeah, they'll option you to AAA if you That's don't exactly go to it. That's right. about it, yeah. uh, to use a baseball reference. But yeah. so for me, I think spring practice is the backbone of your team. I, mm. I truly think so. That I know for me, that's where I won my jobs, right? When I was making the transition from fullback to running back, I won that job my junior year in spring practice. Yeah. And I had to hold off a slew of five-star freshmen my senior year in spring practice. And we saw teams struggle that didn't have spring last year. I don't think there's any denying that communication errors were through the roof last year. How many times, you know, the emoji that's got the hands out? Yeah, exactly. How many times did we see defenses have that? Because there was so much in spring that you go over that seems like day one install because it is, but that's why you start over every year. That's why you do day one, day two, yeah. day three install in the spring. So everyone's on the same page and you've repped it so many times that it's second nature. And if you don't believe that, go back and look who had a spring last year, Coastal Carolina. They got their full spring in because they had it late January, early February. That team was picked to finish last in their division in the Sun Belt. They go on and one of the best teams in the country, not one of the best group of five teams, one of the best teams in the country last year was mm -hmm. Coastal Carolina. Ask BYU when they went to Myrtle Beach, okay? And they had a full spring practice. If you don't think that played a big part in who they were in the Sun Belt and then some of their other games, I mean, I, I can't give you a better example because right yeah. now when you look at the teams like – you know, Coastal Carolina, they were able to get even more practices. Say they got seven and other teams got two. I still think, man, that's five practices. You ask any that's coach, huge. give me it's five huge. practices, and they're going to take it, right? It's like bowl practice. All of those coaches, yeah, they like going to the destination, getting the bowl gifts, but it's the practices. Yeah. If it's not like the playoff, that's the biggest part of that. Yeah, and it's amazing for the young guys. That practice really for Absolutely. the young guys. I remember we're going to play the Camellia Bowl. We had the Puppy Bowl at the end of each practice. And that was yeah. a big evaluation. For those young guys that either are red shirting or aren't getting a ton of reps, a little bit buried in the depth chart. Uh, and again, I, you know, you talk about the play on the field without spring. I saw more base defense this past season and just, all right, here's our couple trips checks. Here's our, our zone and, and man empty checks. We're going to put in some, some blitzes, you know, whether it be fire zone or up in your face, cross guts, whatever. Uh, right. And I think all, some offenses took advantage of that, to be honest with you. They were older, that had veteran guys. That's right. where experience has always came. You, you know, you try and, and emulate stuff in practice, but until you've been in those games, been in those moments, those guys are able to come back and say, listen, we know what we're getting ourselves into. I know how I've got to prepare my body to be able to make it through this because not tackling and doing stuff like that. Everybody talks about, you know, trying to take some of the, the danger out of the game and listen, targeting. Mm -hmm. I understand that getting guys to not lower the crown of their helmet is just as, as much a safety precaution for the defensive guy as it is for the offensive guy. But when right. you go out there and tackle, and you're doing inside drill and you're working that stuff, that is safety. You know, we all remember the first practice mm -hmm. where you got the, you know, the liability where you line the guys up and all right, here's how you do it. You know, your face here, hands through, roll your hips, finish, right. whatever, whatever, get through that. All right, here we go. Let's get past it. But I think it's a great point, Jake. And, and looking, you know, through these spring practices, we've got a lot of changes. There's a lot of quarterback turnover. Uh, and, and I look across the league right now and, and literally just broke recently George Pickens from Georgia tears his ACL. I don't think he's going to be back. I think he's a guy that's going to prepare for the draft. I hate it for the kid. And I want to right. say this, regardless of who you root for, rooting for injuries is disgusting. It's oh, a absolutely. disgusting yeah. thing. And if you, if you played, especially you understand, you hate it for anybody. And again, hope he heals up regardless of what you think or who you root for. But when you look around the league right now, I look at the East and I want to start there, Jake. Yeah. I still think without George Pickens, George is still in a good spot. I think they're going to dominate the East. I don't think the East is going to be, very deep. I think Florida's going to take a step back. Uh, watch out for Kentucky and Missouri. I really like what Mark Stoops is doing over there. And somebody apparently told him you can throw passes in this league now. You can throw the ball <laughs> forward. So I'm interested to see that. But when you look at the East right now, just kind of kind of, how do you see it? I know it's super early. We're going to have you right. back on once we get through all this deal. But kind of how do you see it right now just in your eyes? No, I think you're spot on about the East is, for, you know, from one to seven. I'm not sure yeah. how strong it truly is. It feels like Florida is going to take a step back. But also, if I'm a Florida fan, I, I still I want to keep my expectations pretty high because Emory yeah. Jones, I think he's been in college since Chris Doring was running <laughs> in Florida. I mean, come on. My man has been there. He has learned. Yeah. He's gotten some playing time. I mean, every year he gets playing time, right? And I realize it's a package, but still, like, that's a guy that no coverage should surprise him. He should know his receivers, his running backs, his offensive line, his his coach, Dan Mon. He should know them well. Like, they should be on the same page, okay? So I think that does help them. 
Georgia, obviously JT Daniels, that's going to be the talking point. They seem like the much more talented team this year than Florida. And last year, I thought it was really close. Yeah. But Georgia, they get a lot of guys back, and they actually have a quarterback. You mentioned Kentucky, and you know I love Kentucky. Finding out you could throw a forward pass. How about Georgia figuring out that you can do <laughs> other things than hand the ball off and play action pass? Like, you can do some other stuff, right? They figured that out. I believe in Todd Munkin. I truly do. Me too. The receivers coach when I was at LSU I learned a lot from him even though I didn't play that position they it felt like they took the handcuffs off of him about the middle part of the year whenever JT Daniels became the starter they said okay this is your offense we're not going to hold you back and we saw the results of that so I agree with you it's Georgia Gap Florida and then I think there's some teams that have the potential to be right there Kentucky's going to be able to run the ball man yeah, Kentucky is so, going to be able to run the ball. They have got a stable of running backs. We feel like they're going to be better at quarterback. They go get a hot young guy from the Rams. He's going to be calling the plays there. So that is such a big part of it, just letting loose and allowing that to happen. That's yeah. something to pay attention to. We don't know what we're going to get, Jake, from Tennessee. I, I just uh, I have no idea how that's going to play out. I don't know about Heupel. I don't know about who's going to be left on this roster because everyone seems to be in the transfer portal. South Carolina starting over. So there's going to be, you know, Vanderbilt again is starting over. There's going to be some growing pains in the East. There's no question about that. If Georgia was ever to dominate the East from top to bottom, it feels like this year is the year to do yeah. it. Uh, I agree. And, and you talk about Tennessee and the portal. They've had more guys in the portal than a Mortal Kombat movie. But yeah. uh, I, I just I have a hard time, Jake, believing that the style of offense that Hypo runs is going to work in the SEC uh, going as fast paced because defensively you better start out hot. You better start out hot and you better score a lot because especially if you don't have depth on defense, teams are going to turn around and just start handing that ball off. They're just going to play keep away with you kind of like Texas A&M did last year. And I, I kind of liken it to the globe trotters. Like you don't go watch the globe trotters just because you think they're going to win the game. They always win. It's because the offense was cool and they'd score <laughs> points doing all right. this, but I say the same thing about Lane at Ole Miss. Going fast is great. Mm -hmm. But if you're a defensive coordinator, eventually you've got to start going the speed limit some. Because you're, you're not going to be able to right. outscore everybody. When you play teams like Alabama and teams like Georgia and teams like Florida, it's very hard to go at that breakneck pace for the whole game and not give up 40. And as a defensive guy, it's hard for me to sit there and be like, all right, guys, we played good, but we gave up 35. You know, and, and it's, it's tough. We'll see right. again. You know, with college kids, you really never know. But the East, uh, I agree. I think it's Georgia and a crapshoot. Uh, and I'm going to get to the West. But speaking about a crapshoot, it's not a crapshoot if you buy your sneakers from eBay.com. So head over to eBay.com slash sneakers today, whether you want old ones, the vintage, which we all love, love the vintage, the new stuff, the new Jordans, however you want it. eBay's got it. It's eBay.com slash sneakers. they got a team full of authenticators. They're going to make sure everything is how you want it, the box, the logo, the whole shebang. So head over to ebay.com slash sneakers today and tell them J-Boy sent you. Uh, we're here with Jacob Hester, one of the best guys doing it. You can catch him on Off the Bench, a brand new show with T-Bob Bear. I'm actually going to quote T-Bob here in a second uh, on 104.5 ESPN. Catch him in the afternoon on Sirius XM on the SEC channel. Make sure you check that guys out. Those guys really know ball. Hester, I see a finger up. You got something, dog? Yeah, because we were going to move on from the East, and I was about to be in trouble because my favorite coach maybe – outside of Coach O is Eli Drinkwitz. Yes, sir. And he would have let me know about it, and he should have, because <laughs> Eli is just like I mentioned Kermit Davis for Ole Miss and basketball. Mm -hmm. Eli's the same coach, doesn't get his due. He has done a fantastic job so far in Como. Mm -hmm. He used to join us on Tuesdays, Tank Top Tuesdays on SEC <laughs> this morning. He was, he was so much fun. He's got that team focused. He's mm -hmm. got that team believing. And don't forget, Florida's got to go to Como there in uh -oh, the wintertime, baby. late in the schedule. Not a lot of Florida uh -oh. Gators know what it's like to play in those sleeves up there in Como late in the season. So that's another team that I think is in that Kentucky range, right? Yeah. It's going to be Georgia, Florida, but Kentucky and Missouri are going to be right there in the middle. Yeah, I've got either Missouri or Kentucky finishing second in the East. And the thing yeah. I like about Eli, and I'm going to tag him in this, so I know he's going to watch it. i got to get him on the show soon. But I love what he does from a motion standpoint and a formation oh, standpoint yeah. offensively. That's how they beat LSU. That's exactly right. And I always talk, and I've talked about this on the show before, a lot of that is not just for the play or for leverage. It's about identifying the defense, and it really helps the quarterbacks. I thought what he did with Basilak last year, and there were some ups and downs for a young guy. 
that kid really showed up a lot. I thought he was poised, but Eli's such a passionate guy uh, and, yeah. and he's so much fun to play for. And he's really changed that culture and made it fun to play at Missouri again. And I think they're going to be one of the sleepers uh, to, to finish with maybe eight, nine wins. And they're going to beat somebody they're not supposed to. It may be Florida when they go in there. So of course, you know, Eli, again, uh, he's a guy we've talked about, and that's a great shout-out because it's true. And that's not just, you know, word speak or whatever. That's really true. And if you know the game and you can see what's going on, you can see how he segments. And he does a great job of not sequencing or being predictable from a play-calling standpoint. Uh, and, again, I think he's taken a little bit of where he's gone. Uh, but, uh, you know, Hesse, moving to the West. All right, Alabama loses a lot, but make no mistake, they are loaded. <laughs> All right, they just they, signed. They I got think, five every, stars on the bench. Yeah, that's true. That, I mean, they got guys that are going to be third rounders that haven't even played yet. Uh, but you look at that team, Bryce Young. I think he was a guy that, as crazy as it sounds, was going to give Mac Jones a run for his money if he actually got a spring. Uh, he was sick too, as well. Not a lot of people realize mm -hmm. that. Uh, then got hurt. He's super talented. He brings that dual threat because nothing hurts you worse than locking up guys on first and second down. It's third and seven. Uh, a guy gets out of his pass rush lane. Everybody's covered up. You're in two man and he runs for seven and a half. That, that's what, yeah. you know, Jalen Hurts was the great Tebow at. special. Oh, amazing. It, yeah. They are literally momentum killers for a defense and drive extenders, uh, which is a bad combination if you're on the defensive side of the ball. But looking at that team, they lost a lot up front. They get a ton of early enrollees on the offensive line. You look at Latham, yeah. you can go down the list. It's a who's who. Do you think Alabama – is going to take a little bit of time to get in that rhythm. I think they're going to run through Miami like Casper the Friendly Ghost. But do you think it's going to take them a little bit of time to get back to being as dominant? And again, it's going to be tough to be as dominant as they were last year. I don't know if we'll ever see anything like that again, mixed with the lack of preparation, the experience they right. brought back, the depth that they had. But how do you see the tide early in the season? Look, they are going to replace more than maybe they've had to because one of the things Nick does – and maybe he does better than anybody in the country, he gets third and second rounders to come back to become first rounders. Exactly right. And in this day and age of college football, you know how difficult that is. But Najee Harris, could he have gone pro and been a starting running back? Yeah, but he came back. He improved so much this year, and now he is going to be a first-round pick. He's and not just be... running the ball, Hester. Not no, just no, the ball. no. He he was look his explosive plays his junior year were like 18, 19, 20 yards. He changed that into 40, 45, 50 yard plays. And you're exactly right. Not only running the ball, catching the ball out of the backfield, he improved as a pass, pass protector, protector, which he had there to do go. as well. Because look, it, in college football, you can get away with it. I'm going to free release you, whatever. Ever. we're going to run the spread we're going to have five man protections in the nfl if you can't cross scan you're not going to play yep, and you know i mean obviously you know this but look the offensive line's got four down and mike you got everybody else That's most true. times on third Clean downs the in the up, nfl baby. it doesn't matter who's coming it can be the backside corner you better check him before you get out on a route and you better be able to block him so you had to improve that. He did. He might have been the most improved player in the country last mm -hmm. year man i am such a big fan of what he was able to do so they got that back last year. This year, they're not going to have as many veterans. So maybe maybe it takes them a little bit longer. But at the end of the day, it's going to happen. They're going to figure it out. It's going to click. Now, it might take longer, right? It might not be as dominant early. Still think they're going to win all those games. But it might not be as dominant early because – They've done such a good job of not having mass exodus, and this year they kind of yeah. do have that, that it might look a little different early. But, look, they're so talented. they got talent all over the place. Uh, you'd like to see Bryce maybe get rid of the ball a little quicker when you look at his – uh, you know, his sack totals. I mean, he had seven sacks and not that many attempts last year, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, that will come with time, right? It's going to take reps. It's going to take him growing in the pocket, realizing that it is a little bit different on this level than high school. But he'll figure that that stuff out. So I expect him to get back on the same plane. You know, receiver maybe is the biggest question mark because in the last two years, you've lost four first-rounders. <laughs> we know you've got talent. Mechie, we saw him last year, but who else can step up with him? So if I had a question mark, it'd be probably the receiver position. But again, I'm sure they've got three five-star guys waiting in the yeah. wings. Yeah, they're not – the cupboard's never empty there. And uh, looking down the rest of the West, uh, you look at Auburn. What were your thoughts on the Brian Harson hire? I like the Mike Bobo hire a lot. I think he's mm -hmm. a guy that's going to simplify it for Bo Nix. Because it looked to me last year, number one, his clock's way too sped up. And some of that has to do with right. the offensive line. Uh, I mean, they had more run-throughs than a Pepto-Bismol commercial. And and – you know, when you look at it and, and you look at the offense as a whole, they were placing a lot of receiver, but I think that style of offense 
And everybody always says, oh, now you got to go under center. That's going to be so tough. Look, you got free practice <laughs> in spring, man. Come on. Let, let's, right. It's more about the drop and keeping your eyes where they're supposed to be than it is about actually taking the snap. But when you look at this Auburn team in this first year, because you got to set the culture the first year and the foundation right. the first year, because that's what you're going to look back on three to four years down the road when you have your personnel in there and have built it your way. Just how do you think about the, the, the Brian Harson hire and where Auburn goes from here? I like, first off, I like them going outside the box. I yes. like them hiring someone that is, is you know, different, right? He's a, a West Coast guy, a Boise guy, but he's had so much success. And you don't have to be an SEC guy. I tasked the SEC to have success in this conference. You just don't. I mean, that is a myth. Like, you can still, like when Nick Saban came down here from Michigan State to LSU, that worked out okay for him. And then he parlayed that <laughs> to being the greatest college football coach yeah, of all time. Yeah, it worked out. It was all right. right? I mean, Urban Meyer, I mean, we could give example after example, but they went and got a guy in Boise and a guy in Boise that won all his titles in the Mountain West, right? There was no whack in there. I mean, he won yeah. them all in the Mountain West. And so I do love that. I've had a chance to catch up with him once and I loved it. I couldn't have enough time with him. And then you talk about him stabilizing everything by bringing in some guys who, who have been in this conference, right? Mm -hmm. So recruiting and going into those high schools. But when you talk about Mike Bobo, I thought last year he tried to stabilize South Carolina. He goes yeah. and gets Colin Hill from Colorado State. He goes and gets his fullback from Colorado State. And he tried to say, okay, we're going to stabilize this. We're going to play great defense. We're not going to try to do too much, which that's okay sometimes. Like, But South Carolina didn't have the talent at they the did. end to do yeah. that. Auburn's going to have more talent than South Carolina had. And so what this does for Bo Nix, it gives him an identity. Because I don't think he knows what his identity has been the last so years. True. Because I know I don't. Breaking down the film, yeah. in a six-play span, there can be six different things, and none of it makes sense last yeah. year. And they have to get him steady because the talent's there. There was a reason he was as highly rated as he was. And you can mm -hmm. see it, right? Every – you know, three out of 10 times, you're like, man, that's a hell of a throw by Bo there. Now, if they can just get that seven out of 10 times, right, or six out of 10 times even, Auburn's a better football team. I think you bring in stability with Bobo. I know it's not the sexy hire, but I think right now Auburn kind of needed a Mike Bobo type to try yes. to stabilize everything while they're growing that foundation that you talk about. Yeah, that's exactly right. And look, it's okay to throw the check down. You don't have to run around and do a bunch of <laughs> yes. crazy stuff. It's okay to throw the check down. Uh, I think the play action game is going to be back. I think they're actually going to throw to the tight end that might as well have been the snuffle up against at Auburn yeah. for the past four years because nobody could find him. Uh, but but when you look at that system, I do. I, I agree 100. percent I think you know it actually gets you ready for the NFL a little bit. You know, mixing up under center, understanding right. play action, uh, working the sprint out a little bit. Uh, but again, I, it's addition by subtraction. And uh, as we wind up here, Jake, obviously I won't get to let you on here without talking about LSU, man. Right. Uh, I love the hires they made. I love Pete's. Uh, I, I think he's a guy. I think he Ed tried to go out and get him a Joe Brady clone, and he yeah. got us about as close as possible. Uh, you're going to get a mix of formations. We talked about the motions and stuff with Eli. Uh, you're going to get some option routes. You're going to be able to take advantage of space and do some things leverage-wise that they really didn't do last year. But it looks to me like they got a quarterback controversy brewing over there. And from mm. everything I've heard, Max Johnson may win this deal. It's wide open. It's not one of those deals where the older guys got the leg up or yeah. the young hot shots got the leg up. It is a true competition. Like there is no one right now. And you've got three guys that have started games in college football, which is unique in this day and age in college football. Rare. So, you know, Very TJ rare. Finley came in and played really well against South Carolina. Now he struggled against AM. He struggled against Alabama. But, you know, there's a lot of quarterbacks that struggled against those two teams last year. Max came in and was setting records his last game against Stole Miss. And I realized what that defense was, but he also went to the swamp yeah. and beat a damn yeah. good Florida football That's exactly team, right. right? And he and was some, spinning it. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes, you know, he's a lefty. Sometimes it might look a little herky and jerky. Who cares? Like, yeah. it gets the job done, right? And he is a very athletic guy that can run the RPO stuff. As far as arm talent, I mean, I think all three of them look a little different. Miles has plenty of arm talent, obviously. When he was in for three games, I thought he played extremely well. He couldn't help the defense, couldn't stop a nosebleed. Like, that's not his mm -hmm. fault, right? And I mean, Miles Brennan went out there and put his team in position to win. So, I love the the Miles Brennan story. I'm not going to lie to you. The fact that he didn't take his ball and go home like everybody else does mm -hmm. in college football these days when they're not a starter after three practices, he's waited his turn. And so if he, you know, got first crack at the job, I would not be upset by that. I think as far as overall talent, I think Max Johnson is the most overall talented because he can run the RPO stuff. And 
whenever Jake Peets was hired, I called my former head coach, Norv Turner, who worked with Jake Peets in Carolina when Norv was the OC yeah. there. And the first thing he said was he is a uh, RPO mastermind. He said he knows it backwards and forwards. And to me, I was like, well, okay, well, if that's kind of his specialty, that kind of leans towards Max Johnson a little bit. So that's something to pay right. attention to as well. Yeah, and again, you know, as a defensive guy, those RPOs are a problem if you can run them right. If your timing's good, because, I mean, yeah. half the time, you know, you're having to make your mind up, you know, do I go, do I stay? And you take one step the wrong way, and that slants behind you in the window. Right. And if you're in a certain coverage, it's going to the house. Like, and there's two yeah, and there's two different types of RPOs, which a lot of yes, people like. Yes, oh, go into that. A lot, of, go people, into that, a lot of people can run OPO. Well, RPO can be if you've got a statue back there. Well, it's there's two options, right? I can hand it off. Yep. That's the run part of it, or I can pass it. But if you've got a guy that's got legs back there and he can read that defensive end, it becomes a three part RPO, right? Because I can run it with the running back, I can throw it, or I can run it. So there's different variations. Like a lot of people, whenever I say that, like locally, like wait a minute but an rpo you're either handing it or passing it that's not the case there can be exactly. three parts to an rpo go back and watch the carolina tape teddy bridgewater ran those three-part rpos like they had a guy that could do it last year Taysom hill go watch some saints tape there that's a guy in the nfl that can do it so there's multiple ways to run an rpo and if you have a third option on that rpo well obviously that's going to be greater than two so that's something that a lot of people don't because it doesn't, I guess, happen in the NFL, maybe they don't assume Jake yeah. Peets is going to do it LSU. No, that is going to be something that if Max Johnson's in the game that you have to account for. Yeah, and I'll do you one better. You have your RPOs from the slot. Now, you remember Nick Marshall at Auburn. They were running the wide RPO. They were. You know, quarterback's going to keep it, and we're going to have that third option running down. So if that corner gets heavy, it's a problem. But that's great stuff. Uh, Jake, man, it's always great when I get on there. I can talk to you all day about ball, man. Uh, I know you guys are doing big things down there. I mentioned off the bench. I mentioned the afternoon on Sirius XM. Tell everybody where they can find you on social media because, again, you're a great follow. You know it in and out, and you speak the language. Yeah, at Jacob Hester 18 on Twitter and Instagram. It used to be Jacob Hester 22, but Peter Burns shamed me. I think I told you that story into changing it to number 18. He's like, look, you can't have this legacy number at LSU and not have it in your Twitter uh, handle there. So I, I did make the change, and we do have some exciting stuff coming. Uh, we have converted one of our old studios at 104.5 to a YouTube studio. So T-Bob nice. and I are actually going to be breaking down some film here coming up very shortly during uh, spring practice, kind of after the game. We're going to get get some of the LSU film and break it down and kind of do some deep dives into the X's and O's, which I know you enjoy as well. So uh, hopefully, you know, you can kind of follow along. We're going to try to make it like football 101 type stuff, yeah. try to simplify it so everyone can understand. Definitely. Again, it's just bringing the audience closer. we got some stuff coming up. So I got to get me a telestrator or something, man. I was about but, to uh, say, man, with you being on TV now, as much as you know X's and O's, man, we got to get you on a, a dry erase board or something. Dude, we got to do it. I want to talk some special teams, too. I don't think it gets talked about enough, man. I want to get in my bag on special teams. But, Jake, man, great stuff. I appreciate you. Shout out Peter Burns as well, even though he shamed you, uh, you know, at yeah. the end of the Part -time day. Part-time Peter Burns. Part-time P. Part-time PTPB, baby. <laughs> but, uh, Hester, I really appreciate you, man. And we got to do this again. I appreciate you watching us at home. Make sure you hit the jboyshow.com, get some merch. We got some great stuff coming. Koozies as well, helping you win the water cooler. Subscribe to YouTube. Go check out the YouTube channel uh, with Jacob Hester uh, and T-Bob as well. Those guys are great. Uh, and make sure you're following us on every social media at the J-Boy Show on Twitter and Instagram. It's been another edition of the J-Boy Show. We're talking about RPOs. We're an RPO show. College basketball, football, and baseball, some NFL too. Till next time, J-Boy's going, going. On. The J-Boy Show is produced by David Cohn, Technical Director Dave Hammock. Creative Director, David Culbertson. Audio Engineer, Faison Sharif. Production Assistants, Blaine Crane and Kyle Orr. Executive Producers, Jake Crane, Vince Thompson, Steve Chamberlain, and David Cohn. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, thejboyshow.com, for updates regarding our newest apparel and merch designs. Win the water cooler with The J-Boy Show.